Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us from around the globe and from your home countries. And welcome to a special event within the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas online public lecture series. At firstly, as a reflection of our recognition of the deep history and culture of all of the lands that we live on, we wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, people and custodians of that land and pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you <clears throat> from Sydney, Australia, and I'm on the land of the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, and I pay my personal respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So today we're pleased to present a special public forum for Global Climate Change Week initiative initiated by the University of Tasmania. In partnership with the International University's Climate Alliance, the Global University Consortium on SDG 13 Climate Action, the EAUC, the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education and Second Nature. My name is Leslie Hughes. I'm a professor of biology at Macquarie University in Sydney and also Pro Vice Chancellor of Research there. Um, my personal background as an ecologist is that I've been researching the impacts of climate change on species and ecosystems for most of my career. I'm a former IPCC lead author and now a counsellor with the Climate Council of Australia. This virtual forum will be an opportunity for the higher education sector to deeply reflect on current efforts and collectively ratchet up action to tackle the climate emergency. In fact, just today when I woke up uh, to listen to the news in Sydney, um, the leading news item was a new survey in Australia showing that three quarters of Australians are concerned about climate change, the highest ever um, score on that particular survey. Our presenters today will outline what they're currently doing and explore what more needs to be done across the range of tertiary education's responsibilities, spanning research, teaching and learning, campus operations and community engagement. The University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas series commenced last year to keep the ideas flowing during a period when it was no longer possible to host live public events. And each year the university presents hundreds of lectures, fora, seminars and workshops to nurture the ongoing learning of our students, alumni and the wider community. These types of events are an important role for the university and it's fitting that today's forum is presented as part of that series. So there's just a few housekeeping um, things before we get going. Um, your microphone, camera, chat functions and raised hand function have all been disabled so that the speakers won't be disrupted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions. Um, so the Q&A function is available for you to type in questions. And when all of the speakers have finished their initial remarks, I'll be pulling questions from that list to pose to them. You can ask questions anonymously and the selection, um, as I said, will be answered at the end of the discussion. We'll get through as many as possible. And finally, this lecture is being recorded for later access live on YouTube and sound um, cloud channels. So just by way of introduction, as I'm sure you are all aware, we are in a climate emergency. It's now the topic um, du jour and the topic of the year and really the topic of the century. The recent IPCC report, which was appropriately described as code red for humanity, as well as the upcoming COP26 in Glasgow, is focusing the world's attention on this issue. Truly the greatest challenge, not just of our time, but of the time of our children, grandchildren and all future generations. So I'm now going to introduce the first panelist. I'll be introducing our panelists one at a time. Um, I, I have available to me an enormous bio for each one, and I have already pre-apologized that I'll only be reading out um, the first sentence or two. So our first panelist, welcome to Professor Rufus Black. 
um, who is leading the Global Climate Change Week initiative. He is the Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Tasmania. He's worked extensively in both the private sector as well as the federal and state Australian governments. Um, and we're very much looking forward, Rufus, to what you have to tell us. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And wonderful uh, to be joining everyone in this uh, Global Climate Change Week. And as a university, we're delighted to be playing the role, uh, hosting it uh, and helping uh, organise it. While I might titularly be at the head of that, it's actually a wonderfully passionate group of academic and professional staff who are doing a remarkable job uh, to make all of this happen. And as a week, I think part of the uh, central power of it is the breadth and grassroots and globally collect connected uh, nature of it. Um, and that's something I want to return to is the theme really around how important uh, these initiatives are when they have a breadth and grassroots uh, character to it, involving people as broadly as possible. As a university, as we involve ourselves in tackling this climate emergency, our setting is an interesting one. Uh, we live on an island with 100% renewable, essentially 100% uh, renewable energy. Uh, so in lots of ways, uh, a sustainable future is already with us. Our task is what do we do when you, when you have the beginnings of a really fundamentally sustainable future uh, present? And so it has very much focused our efforts on the deep transformation needed to ensure not just that we have uh, zero carbon uh, in our energy system, but that we are producing a deeply zero carbon uh, economy. And so our focus has very much been on all of the other ways in which we are captured in our carbons, carbon economy and carbon society. And if we start with uh, where, the, what, where, that is, uh, where that is taking us, um, at the very beginning, of course, is pulling ourselves out of the global carbon system with uh, bold divestment, and not just divestment from carbon, uh, uh, any carbon investments, but positive investment in the transition technologies uh, that take us into the future. And again, grassroots matters here. That happened because of the breadth of students and staff uh, creating a university-wide commitment that the trade-offs needed in doing that were fundamental, urgent and necessary. Uh, and that it had to be more than just pulling out, it had to actually be positively putting out our capital uh, at the future. So pulling out of a global carbon system, then recognising that we had to actually do more about taking carbon out now. One of the things that's absolutely focused on us on as we, re, we are in the process of rebuilding our campuses is taking embodied carbon out, which is another way in which we see very large amounts of it problematically arriving now. And here again, a theme of community tackling together has been central. We wanted to reduce by well more than a third the carbon footprint of our new buildings uh, against any reference building of its type. The architects alone couldn't figure out how that could be done. So we actually engaged Tasmanian industry and community to uh, show them all of the different elements of the building that we had, what the carbon content was and what our aspiration was. So actually engaging with the much broader community um, of people committed to it in and outside the university enabled us to find a very broad range of solutions uh, that radically transformed uh, the built that transformed our buildings and taking them well below um, a third less embodied carbon than any reference uh, building that you'd have. And here it really was innovation also at the centre of it. We wanted to actually build, build, uh, make these buildings carbon sinks. So it's putting the university's own research effort and the fact as a public institution, we can take different kinds of risks uh, to actually see timber that had never previously been used for building turned into building materials that would enable us to create those structures. That was happening because uh, our kind of wonderful set of academic team were able to uh, change how we might think about the timbers that were uh, that were available uh, and turn them into turn them into structural products with it with industry. So again, taking the carbon uh, out now. We recognise deeply uh, looking at all of the other sources of carbon we have. While we've been carbon neutral for uh, now for quite a long time, it's been driven by offsets. So it's been deeply probing where are all the places in which, uh, in which we are causes of needing to offset and going after every source uh, item, item by item. 
uh, to get that uh, to get that out. And some of that from transitioning uh, vehicle vehicle fleets to finding places where gas might still being used to, to generate heat. And again, working through the alternative, working through alternative sources. So there's an app, a rigor and a discipline uh, around innovating every single last item that you can uh, that you can find. We've got a way to go. We know where it is, and we know what the innovation challenge is for each of those components. But perhaps it's at the grassroots level of our need for a really deep, more radical transformation in how we live that we recognise we need to make uh, we need to make changes. And here um, we we. Uh, uh, see this as a collaborative, uh, all all in effort. But equally, universities have a critical role to enable that. One of the interesting places that we're tackling is food choices. Uh, so, one of we know the amount of uh, the amount of carbon that gets embodied uh, in the whole food production system. Actually, a lot of food happens on campus. So, one of the things that we recognise is we need to create different kinds of food uh, food choices. And moving away from having a central large provider of campus food services to actually uh, getting out of that contract and making our campus available uh, to multiple small local vendors uh, who want to actually work with our, our values around how do we provide locally produced low carbon uh, foods uh, that are also affordable and accessible so that actually driven by staff choice and student choice uh, and local engagement, we can transform our participation in actually the still very high carbon uh, global uh, global food system and create consciousness uh, and awareness um, of that and take a more radical step, which we'll do in, uh, in our Launceston campus of actually starting to grow food at scale uh, on campuses. So we can see what it is when a community starts to take hold uh, of that part of the global, uh, the global, food, uh, global food system. So I think our space as a, as a civic institution gives us a capacity to take action at a large scale, uh, but actually by enabling uh, all of the micro changes that are needed. And of course, the next frontiers lie um, in driving the transport changes uh, more, uh, much more deeply. And that is everything from ensuring all, all we are I can actively incentivize the change um, away from fossil fuel driven uh, modes of transport to non fossil fuel uh, modes. Uh, but that's where institutions again are enabling more radical and localized uh, community uh, community choices. Uh, and finally, I think the one thing that we know is that we wouldn't be able to get where we are unless the university was a place actively enabling uh, the vigorous and free debate amongst all of our all of our uh, staff and students uh, about what needs to be happening and enabling them to hold the university to account uh, for them to be challenging us to all of the points um, where we could be doing more and being more radical uh, and driving harder and institutionally to be open to the challenge um, of that uh, of that bold uh, activism uh, and pushing forward of ideas on every front um, that we uh, that we see so institution as enabler institution held to account, institution committed uh, to whole of system systemic change are the themes uh, that are central to the way in which we look uh, in which we look at this challenge. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rufus, and congratulations to you and your leadership and the University of Tasmania for um, some really exciting initiatives that are really showing everybody else the way from from food to buildings to supporting student activism, I think you've got us off to a great and very inspiring start. So thank you and thank you for hosting this event. All right, um, our next speaker is Professor Jim Longhurst. Jim is leading the EAUC, the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education Initiative. Jim is Professor of Environmental Science and Assistant Vice-Chancellor for Environment and Sustainability at UWE Bristol. Take it away, Jim. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and, and thank you to the University of Tasmania for inviting me to join this uh, leadership panel today. I'm going to share some slides, if I may. So, Leslie, if you could just confirm that you can see these. Um, and when that is the case, I will begin. Can I just check? Uh, yes, Jim, all good. 
Thank you very much. OK, so what I want to do in the eight minutes that I have available is rattle through a number of slides with some examples for what we in the University of the West of England in Bristol have been doing, and then some remarks about the climate leadership that the EAUC is undertaking. But first, I want to have uh, just a little context, just something about the size and importance of higher education in the United Kingdom. Around 2.3 million students, 429,000 staff, about 4.1% of the UK population, and an annual expenditure of 37 billion. Just for a moment, think, if all of that resource was directed towards the net zero future, what we could do. And the reason we should be thinking that is because we know we can do it. During the COVID pandemic, universities have repurposed themselves in all sorts of ways, doing things that in the normal run of events we would never have imagined was possible. So we know with the leadership that enabled and empowered that rapid change, we could repurpose our institutions to deal in a rapid way with the climate emergency. And the reason we need to do that is the students that graduate from our institutions this academic year will, according to actuary tables in the United Kingdom, have about 60 years of life. That will take them into the 2080s when they will be living through the changing climate with all that that uh, entails for their life course. So how have we in our institutions prepared them for that life course that will live, they will live through the adverse climate and ecological changes. And the next cohort of students beyond them and the ones after that will be even more aware of these issues and expecting us to do ever more that's preparing them for those challenges that they will face. And that will go right across everything that the university is about. So what have we been doing in the University of the West of England? Well, for about the last 25, 26 years, we've been engaging in environmental activity. And then as the language of discourse changed, the sustainability agenda across curriculum, across research, across our campus management and with our civic engagement and working to have a culture in the institution that is um, informed by and supportive of a sustainable university, but always in partnership with our students and the student union. Now, the university has a strategy called Strategy 2030, which sets us some very powerful commitments about sustainability. And as you can see in this quote, one of those is about addressing the urgency of the climate and ecological emergency and striving to fulfill our role in meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we have seven very ambitious commitments in our strategy, but the most challenging of those is net zero emissions by 2030 for scopes one, two, and three of the uh, Greenhouse Gas Protocol. We have a range of other initiatives to support environmental management, but at, as you see at six and seven, we are very keen that we work explicitly with our students to address the climate emergency through the curriculum and to orientate our research so that we support the climate change research requirements and the biodiversity research requirements. And the things that we have been doing within the contents of that strategy is to set our net zero target, to make our climate emergency declaration to establish our baseline for scope one and two with some degree of certainty, for scope three with a lot of ambiguities, but working hard to understand what they are and to uh, improve our understanding. We've set our carbon management plan using the greenhouse gas protocol and science-based targets. We're working in partnership with the local authorities and the enterprises in the hinterland of the university. And of course, we've begun the orientation of our research, setting up an internal network of support around the climate agenda, making sure our research is in the context of climate action and sustainability, developing the literacy training for staff around the climate and carbon agenda. You can't get the curriculum right if our staff don't feel confident and empowered. And we're infusing the carbon literacy into our curriculum. 
that's what we in the university are doing. I want to spend a few minutes now just talking about the work of the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education and the EAUC's work in this regard. Perhaps the one thing I must mention above all else is the work of the EAC in helping to establish the Climate Commission in the United Kingdom for higher and further education in partnership with the AOC, UUK and Guild HE sector bodies. Um, five priorities about mobilizing our voice for action, making sure we focus on research and innovation for real benefit in the climate agenda, clarifying and enhancing the transparency of how we measure and report um, carbon, bringing adaptation to the fore, the bit that is rather underplayed in all of the conversations thus far, at least in the United Kingdom. We need to focus on it, how we are to adapt for all the things that we can't mitigate. And then how we bring the student uh, curriculum experience to the fore to actually ensure they have the skills and competencies that will enable them to live and hopefully thrive in that changing future. As a commission, uh, three ambitious targets were set. Scope one and two, net zero by 2030, significant action by 2030 on scope three, and then to have achieved a net zero scope three in the sector no later than, and ideally much earlier than 2050. In order to support institutions, the Climate Commission uh, prepared the Climate Action Toolkit, uh, which sets out a range of practical actions that institutions can take to decarbonize their activities and to orientate the curriculum and research and civic engagement agenda to, uh, to a net zero future. And this can be downloaded from the links that you see on screen. The EAUC quite properly recognizes there are lots of uncertainties and ambiguities in the way targets for various things are set. And there is now an emissions Ill alignment program which is designed to uh, reduce uncertainties, enhance transparency through a peer verification of greenhouse gas inventories that universities publish, the carbon abatement targets, the offsetting targets, and the neutrality claims. This, I think, is a significant innovation on behalf of uh, the sector. The EAUC initiated the climate letter, which has now been in. Um, wrapped into the UN race to zero. It's the climate letter for universities to make their public declaration and to report on their commitments. And I hope institutions that are on this call have signed. If not, please look at it and do sign. And the EAUC also initiated the Sustainable Development Goals Accord, a similar activity uh, to bring institutions to uh, a public declaration and an annual reporting of their commitments. So in summary then, what do I think universities uh, can do? Well, I think we have a really powerful role to play in decarbonizing uh, society. We are thought leaders, we shape public opinion, and we can build the case for action. We have significant financial resources, which we can use wisely. We, of course, will educate students about the life course challenges they will face. Our research delivers understanding of causes and consequences and increasingly is focused on solutions. But equally, we can ensure our campus locations are properly adapted to those future changes that we know are coming. We can rapidly reduce our emissions. I can't say mitigate enough. We must drive carbon out of the system. And we can work in with local stakeholders to do that so that we jointly address local climate impacts and opportunities for reframing the way that the industrial and commercial activity of the country is oriented. And of course, we can all join the UN race to zero. So that's it from me, Leslie. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much, Jim. Um, that was absolutely inspiring in terms of the, the diversity and breadth and maturity of the programs that you were talking about. I think you've uh, probably made a few participants shift uncomfortably in their seats, actually, because you're so far ahead of, of many other institutions, but I'm sure you have been inspiring.
Before I introduce the next speaker, um, could I remind all the participants that you can be putting your questions for the panel into the Q&A. Uh, they can be either directed at a specific panelist or at the panel in general. So our third speaker, welcome Dr. Stacey Richards-Kennedy. Um, Stacey is the Pro Vice-Chancellor Global Affairs at the University of West Indies. Um, this is really an extraordinary university because it's a five campus regional university serving 17 countries across the Caribbean. And she is joining us today from the campus in Barbados. Stacy is leading the Global University Consortium on SDG 13. Over to you, Stacy. Thank you very much, Leslie, and uh, greetings to everyone who's joining us from different parts of the globe. Greetings from the Caribbean. It's a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of the University of the West Indies, I wish to extend my sincere thanks to the organizers for their kind in invitation to participate in this very important virtual event. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to join the members of this panel and to share examples of the work that the University of the West Indies has been doing to advance climate action in the Caribbean. And Leslie, as you said, the, our university is leading the uh, Global University Consortium on SDG 13, and uh, we, we are um, we consider ourselves uh, an SDG engaged university. Uh, we are also an activist university located in the global south and therefore uh, we uh, have been a pivotal force in shaping the development of the post-colonial societies of the Caribbean. So at this stage I'd like to share my screen and just pull up a quick powerpoint that can help guide us through some of the work that we've been doing. Checking that you can see my slides on your end. Yes. Yes, all good, Tracy. Good. Thank, thank you for that confirmation. Okay, so who are we? The University of the West Indies is a full service, comprehensive public university with over 50,000 students and roughly 5,000 staff members. It is a regional university, one of only two in the world, the other being the University of the South Pacific. And we were established some 73 years ago to serve multiple territories in the Caribbean. We have five campuses based in Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Antigua and Barbuda, Jamaica, and an open campus that is dedicated to online learning. As I mentioned earlier, we consider ourselves an SDG engaged university and the work that we do um, covers a wide range of areas, um, teaching, research, advocacy, partnerships, and sustainability practices. Um, and these must align with and contribute to advancing the SDGs, but also to our triple A strategic plan uh, with three main pillars, which, um, sorry, which connect to strengthening access, alignment, and agility. We were ranked uh, in 2021, earlier this year, by Times Higher Education impact rankings among the top 2.5% uh, in the world linked to our work on SDG 13, climate action, SDG 5, gender equality, SDG 3, good health and well-being, and of course, SDG 17, which is the global partnerships for the sustainable development goals. So today I'd like to focus a bit on what we have been doing and how we have been leveraging our partnerships as a small university in the global south to advance climate action. Now in 2018, UWI was nominated by the International Association of Universities to lead the SDG 13 cluster and we have uh, established therefore the Global University Consortium on SDG 13. We seized this opportunity because we saw how that it provided a very important platform for engaging with universities who are committed to climate action and to building out a robust work program of research collaborations, joint symposia and other advocacy opportunities. So for example, um, we have done several symposia at the UN high level political forum and uh, our consortium members 
include these uh, 10 universities um, from the six geographic regions across the world. We also have a knowledge management portal, universitiesforclimateaction.org. So far, we have been uh, operating through in-kind support from our member consortium members. And uh, we now have a dedicated staff member who is helping to activate the cluster and support with cluster management. But of course, these, uh, as you can understand and appreciate, there really needs to be significant um, uh, efforts to boost that collaboration. And that's something we're looking at in terms of how we can generate and mobilize increased funding to support the rolling out of a more um, aggressive program with members. We have leveraged research expertise of the consortium members for different symposia, as I mentioned. And I'll just share a few. For example, we had the 2019 symposium at the UN headquarters on research and innovation for climate action in collaboration with UNDESA. We also had a UN Global Climate Summit event entitled the Symposium on Global P Partnerships for Climate Action. And this brought together a number of heads of multilateral agencies who work with, are committed to working with the universities to advance the climate action agenda. And then with our partner from Colombia, Uniandes, we had the UE Uniandes Symposium on Climate Action, which was held at our Mona campus in Jamaica, just before the onset of the pandemic. And since, since then, earlier this year, we had a virtual event uh, with the United Nations Academic Impact and our consortium member from Norway, University of Bergen, on partnering to educate the ocean science leaders of the future. And this was opened by Ambassador Peter Thompson, UN Special Envoy for Oceans. Now, as I mentioned, um, because of our small size uh, and being a relatively young public university in the Caribbean, we fully understand the challenges um, that come with being small and also because of the legacies of colonialism being located in highly vulnerable and open economies with small populations, limited capacity and so on. With the visionary leadership of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, the UWI has pursued a robust global engagement strategy to build out strategic alliances and partnerships uh, with that sole purpose in mind, which has to do with allowing for greater advocacy on the SDGs, as well as increasing opportunities for internationalization and for spreading and disseminating um, our teaching and research collaborations, as well as the impact of our work. So this slide gives an, an idea of the spread of our network of UWI global centers and consortia across different geographic regions. And let me just take this opportunity to thank Professor Ian Jacobs and his team at the Alliance, um, the International Universities Climate Alliance for their leadership on the, of this important consortium and for their firm support for including the UWI and ensuring diversity um, in the deliberations and the work of the International Climate Alliance. Uh, we believe that the research that's being produced by the Caribbean small island states is very important to the global discourse on climate action. And so we're really um, excited to be participating in our different consortium. Now, this uh, slide just gives a quick overview of some examples of our taught programs, because again, we're trying to advance our work in the, on different fronts. So this has to do with teaching. And you'll see here the range of programs um, that span seven, seven faculties. And more and more, of course, we're encouraging more inter, interdisciplinary programming and um, joint courses. Here we have um, examples of our research programs and the different types of research clusters, research centers, and institutes that are focused on sustainable development and climate change issues. In the interest of time, I won't go through them, but I know we can make slides available to all of our participants, and I'm happy to, to be in touch if there's anyone who would like to have more information on these um, research clusters. Now, as a university, we firmly believe not only in producing new knowledge, 
but also in ensuring that this knowledge is used and translated into policy, new practices and new ways of thinking in the communities. Through our longstanding partnership with the UNDP, we are strengthening the research policy interface through our joint public policy think tank for a blue, blue economy. And this provides dedicated support for commissioned research studies that are helping to foster multidisciplinary um, and multi-stakeholder collaborations and providing technical advice to governments across the region. It is a flagship initiative that we're really quite proud of and it demonstrates the power of partnerships with purpose and a successful modality for increased utilization of research to advance the SDGs. This slide also shares some examples of our science diplomacy efforts and um, there are several examples here. I can just highlight a few. We have nine academics contributing to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Some have been lead authors uh, for the special report on climate change and land, as well as the special report on global warming. Many do not realize that the research underpinning the global campaign on 1.5 to stay alive emanated from our UWI climate studies group in Mona, Jamaica. And they had been one of a set of lead advocates for um, global temperatures to be kept well below the two degrees um, mark in order to prevent catastrophic effects, um, particularly to island territories and coastal communities. Moving very quickly, we also have in terms of research application, some of examples of the different projects that are being led across our faculties and campuses. We have the Caribbean's first net zero impact, uh, zero energy building, sorry, at our Muna campus in Jamaica. The application of advanced water capture technology using source hydro panels um, at our University Hospital of the West Indies in Jamaica, and also um, electric vehicle charging stations at our St. Augustine campus in Trinidad. I mentioned earlier our work um, with the University of Bergen. This is an expedition that's currently underway, and in a few weeks time, we will be welcoming um, this historic uh, research vessel to our um, dock in Kingston, Jamaica, and we will be hosting a, uh, a symposium there. There's going to be um, significant um, ocean scientific research being conducted on the vessel, and it's an important opportunity for students and faculty to participate in the One Ocean webinar series with a range of other institutions like uh, McGill and Stanford University, University of Washington, and so many others. And then finally, this is... Um, a project that is currently underway with support from the Open Society Foundation. We're in the process of consolidating our work in support of climate action. And um, we have prepared an institutional strategy on climate justice and resilience, very important to uh, our region. And it has been the result of extensive consultations and collaborations. So five pillars we see emerging from this, the university campus as a living laboratory, um, a commitment to reduce operational emissions and achieve carbon neutrality by 2030, regional and community engagement and youth advocacy and ensuring that we continue to give opportunities to our students and graduates and student alumni. Um, and then um, climate justice as, and as environmental stewardship, as well as the, the entire planning and coordination administration and reporting on the, 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 the work of our campuses and our commitment to reducing our carbon footprint. So colleagues, thank you very much. I'll stop there. And it's, it's really um, been a pleasure sharing with you how we've been leveraging our international partnerships to advance SDG 13. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks so much for that inspirational um, international overview, um, showing how much can be driven by some of the world's most exposed and vulnerable nations. And those of us in wealthier, larger countries um, can absolutely learn an enormous amount. So thank you so much for sharing. Our next speaker is Steve Muzzy. Steve is from the Second Nature Initiative that I'm sure he's going to tell us about. In fact, he's the Climate Program Senior Manager at Second Nature. 
He has an environmental science and environmental education background. Um, over to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to participate on this panel. I'm gonna share my screen and run through some slides. And as Leslie uh, mentioned, uh, I'm Steve Muzzy. I'm Senior Manager of climate, climate Programs at Second Nature. And Second Nature is a nonprofit organization that was uh, founded in 1993, and we are based in the United States uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Our mission is to accelerate climate action in and through higher education. And our niche is that we provide opportunities and programming for senior leaders at colleges and universities to engage in climate action. So with my time today, I'm going to share two overviews of uh, two programs that we currently have in place at Second Nature, beginning with the, uh, what was known as when it launched in 2006, the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, otherwise known as the ACUPCC. And to our knowledge, we believe it to be the oldest and longest standing voluntary carbon neutrality commitment in existence. Oh, did I go? Uh oh, having a little delay on my slides. So in 2006, these 12 founding signatory presidents and chancellors sent an invitation to their peers to join the commitment. And the invitation really is three commitments. The first is to eliminate operational greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. The second commitment is to publicly report progress. And the third commitment is to support the education, research, and community engagement efforts towards the goal of carbon neutrality. And I do want to point out just uh, of these 12 presidents, the higher education sector in the United States is very diverse in institution type. And these 12 presidents do a good job of representing that breadth of diversity in institution type. So we have a very large research university and we also have small rural associate or two year non-residential colleges. And this is a very unique initiative in higher education in the United States where all these different institution types have come together towards a shared goal. So it quickly grew. In 2008, the ACU PCC represented, was represented in every state uh, across the country. In 2010, the first climate action plans were reported publicly to the reporting platform. And then in 2015, Second Nature went through a rebranding and expansion of the climate commitment offerings. So today we offer three distinct climate commitments that a campus can engage with. The first is the carbon commitment, which is basically the ACU PCC where you're committing to eliminating operational greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. There is a standalone resilience commitment and this focuses on the formalizing of a campus community partnership where the campus and community will assess their climate vulnerabilities and then work together to prioritize the areas where they want to increase capacity to withstand their climate impacts. Just to note that the resilience commitment does not require any greenhouse gas accounting or tracking or uh, reduction uh, goals. So then the third commitment is climate commitment, and that is the integration of the two, resilience and carbon. So these three commitments share uh, common elements, which is they have to be made by the president or chancellor on behalf of the institution. They have to publicly report progress annually, and they have to support the education, community engagement, and uh, research opportunities uh, related to the commitment. So I wanted to just share kind of a quick visualization of the reporting structure under a commitment. And we'll just quickly focus on the carbon commitment top left. Uh, within two months of signing, uh, institution is asked to coordinate and develop and report its institutional structure. That would be the team task force committee responsible with the planning, 
uh, the reporting and execution of the plan. Uh, within one year, it's a baseline emissions inventory that is submitted publicly. And then two years would be the initial climate action plan with the strategies and goals for decarbonization. And then just a quick highlight of the climate commitment in orange, this is the kind of an expansion of uh, greater planning. But again, two year, uh, within two months is the institutional structure. Within a year, you would assess your existing campus community partnerships to develop your campus community uh, task force. Two years would be your resilience assessment. And then in the third year, you would develop and submit your climate action plan that includes both decarbonization and climate resilience uh, goals and strategies. The other uh, thing that is, it, all these institution signatories are then asked to review and revise if necessary their climate uh, action plan every five years. Next slide. Uh, uh, Sorry, very delay in the slide moving. I want to show a quick uh, slide and some images from the public reporting platform. You'll see a, a chart that shares the trajectory of emissions reporting. Uh, there's also kind of a collective aggregation of scopes and uh, how, how an institution is doing in relation to the drawdown of those scope of emissions. And then there's some normalization data. Uh, and then you can also dig deeper into the individual greenhouse gas inventories and climate action uh, plan reports for each institution. And speaking of climate action plans, we then repurpose and repackage those, uh, that data that is submitted publicly. Uh, so there are data fields as part of the report, but we also ask institutions to upload the file of their plans and the climate action plans can take many forms. Uh, it can be very focused on the climate action plans, decarbonization goals and strategies. It could be a sustainability, a broader sustainability plan. It could be a very specific energy master plan. And in some cases, it could even be the, uh, the institutional strategic plan that prioritizes decarbonization. This is a very valuable resource for our, our signatories as it allows them to, to learn from the network of campuses that have made this commitment. So moving to the second program I wanted to highlight, we have the University Climate Change Coalition or UC3. So this is a group of research universities throughout North America where they have pledged together to reduce their carbon footprint, but they've also committed to convening this, uh, a cross-sector uh, climate form uh, within the community in which they reside. So in whatever city or town or, or county, they would work with, uh, them to develop this forum that would invite the, the population to learn more about climate change and climate action. They've also agreed to share climate research across institutions, and this all builds on educational opportunities around working groups and panel discussions, as well as you know, continuous or, or year-long programming for their local communities to learn about climate. The next slide will show uh, the, the participants in the University Climate Change Coalition. Hit twice, uh, go back. <laughs> I believe there are 22 at the moment. And once the slide shows, it will be the, uh, it will also show geographically where the campuses are located throughout North America. And I'm not gonna hit the forward again because it does not seem to be working. So together, the University Climate Change Coalition and the Climate Leadership Commitment Signatories, this is the, the overall impact. Uh, they represent together hundreds of thousands of staff and faculty, almost 5 million students are represented, uh, more than $200 billion of annual total operating expenditures across these institutions and $178 billion in endowment value. And then through the public reporting of progress, we have estimated that these institutions have saved $230 million in operating expenses uh, due to their decarbonization projects. We currently have 10 carbon neutral campuses, the first in 2013, Colby College, uh, here are the next five, and we had three uh, meet the goal of carbon neutrality in 2020. 
Then finally, I just wanted to quickly share what are the emission sources that signatories are committing to eliminate. And here they are under the, the three scopes. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Many thanks, Steve, and I'm, I'm sorry for the slowness of the slides, but um, you did manage to convey um, an extraordinary array of activities, um, and I'm sure there'll be great interest from um, especially universities outside North America as to what we can learn from your program. Um, once again, before I introduce the, the final speaker, um, please pop your questions for either individual panellists or for the panel in general into the Q&A because we'll be getting to Q&A fairly shortly. Um, our fifth speaker is Professor Ian Jacobs. Professor Ian Jacobs is leading the International Universities Climate Alliance Initiative. He's been the President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of New South Wales here where I am in Sydney since 2015 and is the chair of the Group of Eight Australian Universities since 2018. Take it away, Ian. Thank you, Leslie. Good morning, everyone. A, a very warm welcome to the other speakers and participants from across the world. And as I'm in Australia, I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and I pay my respects to their elders and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Thank you again, Leslie, and thank you, Rufus, for the invitation to join in this important discussion. And thanks, Rufus, to your university for showing the way in thought leadership through this and so many other great events. I enjoyed hearing your talk and the inspiring talks from Jim, Stacy, and Paul. I, I should note at the outset that I come to this not in any way as an expert on climate science. My expertise is in medicine, health and surgery, and as a, a university leader, but I come to it above all as a concerned citizen who wants to see action on climate change. And it's a, a heady time for climate action. We've all felt, I hope you've felt, a shift in the momentum on climate change in the past year with a seemingly greater level of acceptance of the existential threat that we all face. And as we work towards COP next month, that meeting is emerging as a pivotal moment for our planet, as significant as COP21 in Paris in 2015, perhaps more so. We've wasted decades debating the reality of climate change and we faced obstacles to a meaningful progress because of ideology and disinformation from vested interests. Failure at COP in Glasgow is really, really not an option. The latest IPCC report was clear. We, we can avoid some of the worst aspects of climate change, but only if we act right now. I've been a passionate advocate of political leaders and business tapping into the deep well of knowledge that our universities house. And you've heard a lot of that this morning. And now is the moment to recognize the asset they have at their fingertips. And that's why last year, UNSW Sydney established the International Universities Climate Alliance, IUCA. Our host university this morning is a founding member and I'm delighted that our newest partner, the University of the West Indies was represented so well on this panel today by Dr. Stacey Richards-Kennedy. Welcome to IUCA UWI. The International University Climate Alliance is an initiative unprecedented in scale and scope. It now has more than 50 member universities representing many of the leading universities in climate science, environmental research and sustainability worldwide. And with that spread of institutions across every continent, we can gain a better understanding of the unique impacts of climate change in various regions. And when institutions join together, and you've heard some wonderful examples of that from the previous speakers, when institutions join together for the common good of the global community, we see education, 
and research and our universities at their very best. The Climate Alliance is working to turn the tide of misinformation, to communicate climate science clearly and with authority, and to support world leaders, industry and communities plan for and respond to the climate challenges ahead of us. Now, of course, right now we're living in an incredibly volatile world. Geopolitics is arguably more unstable than it has been since the Cold War. But if we can take heart from anything in these last two tumultuous years of the pandemic, it's the newfound reliance on expert opinion to guide us. As it becomes crystal clear that we need civic significant reductions to global emissions by 2030, on our way to net zero by 2050, our political and business leaders will once again turn to science to find ways to make up for lost time. And the pandemic showed the power of research collaboration and the way it can fast track solutions. Just look at vaccine development. The same effort needs to be applied in addressing climate change. The International University Climate Alliance said in its G20 declaration last year that we already have at our disposal the evidence-based solutions to decarbonize and strengthen economies. And we're just waiting for the call as a group of universities. If universities from disparate nations and regions with governments of different political leanings can come together and speak as one on climate, that sends a powerful message to the world. But it doesn't preclude us from contributing at an institutional level. And you've heard some great examples of that today. I'm not going to say too much about UNSW, but I, I can't speak without noting how proud I am of the efforts of the UNSW community in Sydney to lead by example, as our students and staff rightly demand. Last year, our campus achieved the goal of net zero emissions from energy use in an innovative solar power purchase agreement with a solar farm and energy provider, we now power our buildings with renewable energy from solar cell technology. And it's gratifying that that technology, photovoltaics was first developed by UNSW researchers some 40 years ago. Now, as we near COP26, UNSW like so many other universities have signed up for Race to Zero for universities and colleges, which is part of a broader UN-led campaign to rally leadership and support across the world. There is already an expectation that universities will show leadership on sustainability and on cutting greenhouse gas emissions. And Race to Zero asks heads of organizations to publicly state their targets to pledge to reach net zero as soon as possible, to plan the actions to be taken to achieve both interim and longer term pledges, to proceed to take immediate action and to publish an annual report on their progress. So I finish by emphasizing that modeling the behavior we want to see by promoting clear, fact-based information on climate change, by collaborating on solutions, and by speaking as one on the need for action. University collaboration can be a potent antidote to the volatility of today. As the keepers of centuries of knowledge on climate and the environment, we are so well placed to support global decision makers make informed and ambitious plans. Thank you again, Rufus and, and Leslie, for giving me the opportunity to speak today, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks, thanks very much, Ian. Um, and I am going to come back and ask you some specifics about the, the solar technology that you very modestly um, uh, outlined there. Um, I'm going to begin now with uh, a sort of a warm-up question to all of you because I'm, I'm waiting on, on our, on our um, audience to, to put some more questions into the Q&A, so don't feel shy about doing that. But I'm interested in it, firstly exploring with all of you what was your personal perhaps light bulb moment or perhaps slow realisation that has brought you to the position now that you are all in 
of leading on climate action, leading your institutions, leading in the community. I'm always really interested um, to understand <clears throat> how individuals come to that particular position because sometimes it, it's not easy. So perhaps Ian, I'll, I'll start with you because I've got you big on the screen. So did you have a light bulb moment um, or was it a slow realization? And, and why did you decide to take a leadership position in this area, given that your background, as you say, was in medicine. Yeah, well, thanks, Leslie. I, I think I was quite slow. In retrospect, I, I, my eyes only really opened to this when I moved from the UK to Australia to take up my role at UNSW Sydney and engage there with brilliant climate scientists and our activist students and staff. And in, in the role of vice chancellor of a big university, I came under very, very intense pressure. And that forced me to really look closely at the, the data, the evidence, the steps that could be taken. And I very quickly concluded that I, I had not only a role, but also a responsibility to, to, to push forward this agenda when I saw so many people around the world so many leaders who were in business, in industry, in politics, in, in some other universities, not those represented today, who, who were ignoring what, what is a catastrophic, um, potentially catastrophic challenge for society. So my light bulb moment was my first six months to a year at UNSW. Thank you. So, and while I've got you, Ian, you, you did mention the role of UNSW in developing solar technology. And, and many of us in Australia are very aware of that, but I imagine that there are many listening to this um, uh, webcast that, that are not so aware. Could you give, give us all a, just a little bit of a potted history of the role of UNSW in what we see today as one of the most successful renewable industries? Yes, well, thanks, thanks for asking about that. Um, so I arrived at a university and inherited this rich tradition of absolutely stellar work, which started 40 years ago, led by Martin Green, who is now, he is, he is still a very active um, Scientia professor at UNSW and is now being recognized by awards around the world on a regular basis. The work that he and his team have led, um, which started off with understanding the, the science of capturing energy using solar photovoltaic technology and has then led to technological advances and scientific advances, which are now um, represented in, in just about every solar cell that is produced around the world. And they, they are responsible for increasing the efficiency of photovoltaics and solar, solar capture and making it so efficient that it is now a very, very competitive form of, of energy. Um, almost 50% almost I believe of the um, technology in photovoltaics and solar that people are using right now around the world has its origins in, in science at UNSW. So we're, we're proud of that. That work is not finished. We, we're still pushing, pushing hard with it. And thanks Leslie for giving me a chance to have an advertorial for UNSW there. <laughs> but I do think it is, that is a piece of work that is fundamentally important for the future of humanity. That's what universities are, of course, about. I think UNSW should be rightly in, incredibly proud of that achievement and uh, Martin and his, and his group. All right, let, let me go to Jim Longhurst now. So Jim, uh, was there a light bulb moment for you? How did you come to this position of leadership in this space? Well, I'm an environmental scientist that's worked in air and carbon management for all of my, my career. But my, funny enough, my light bulb moment was nothing to do with the atmosphere. It was actually where I grew up in Cornwall in the far southwest of England, where in 1970, no, earlier than that, the Torrey Canyon oil tanker ran aground on rocks off the Cornish coast. And it was the devastation that um, occurred across the, uh, the coast of Cornwall that really made me into somebody who was really concerned about the environment. And, and then my career as an environmental scientist came about because of that light bulb moment, the human impact on the environment. 
Thanks, Jim. I'll, I'll be coming back to you with a specific question um, in a minute, but let's go to Steve now. Steve, you've got a background as an environmental scientist, so you were probably pre-adapted for getting into climate change work, but specifically, um, how did you become, you know, a leader in this area? Uh, well, it, it's <laughs> very personal, actually. A, a dear friend had introduced me to the natural world, uh, long backpacking trips uh, throughout uh, the United States and uh, national parks. Uh, and then he passed away in an ice climbing accident and I wanted to carry on his beliefs and values. And that led me to, to graduate school, uh, environmental studies, and environmental education. Uh, and while there, sustainability was the, the big buzzword and I, it just resonated with me. So I, I kind of hit it at the right time. And uh, I did another master's program uh, that was uh, developed in collaboration with the Natural Step in an engineering school in Sweden. And uh, my thesis led, was focused on campus sustainability in the United States. And I was able to interview the founder of Second Nature. And so I, I'm just very fortunate. I, I landed my dream job and I've, I've been here ever since. Well, going on 15 years. <laughs> It's wonderful when people do get to their dream job and, and stay there. Thank you, Steve. Now, Stacy is off camera because she was having internet issues, but I'm hoping she can hear me. Stacey, um, oh, there you are yes, again. Yes, um, I'm back on. Your, your light bulb moment, how did you become a leader in this space? Um, for me, uh, I think it goes back to um, my days as a student. Uh, my first degree was at the, the UWI campus in St. Augustine. And one of my professors at the time uh, reminded us and really emphasized that um, uh, it's not enough to be a scholar based on intellect. So that a, a true scholar is not someone who just has intellect, but it must be someone who has intellect and compassion. And that is what thrust me into the work of international development, which is really my background. And, you know, having worked with international development agencies, um, you know, across the globe, starting with UNESCO in Paris, and then um, the World Bank and IDB in Washington, and then coming back to the Caribbean, and wanting to use that experience of bringing together universities uh, with international development uh, agencies so that we can connect the, the knowledge and the scientific research to influence um, the development trajectory of small island developing states. And of course, for us who live in small islands, the climate agenda is one of the biggest agendas that you know, we have to deal with because we're on the front line. And so for me, it's also about how we try to um, recover from the, the damage and the loss that we experience in the Caribbean when we have more intense climatic events such as hurricanes and extreme flooding. And, and this is what we have been seeing and living every year um, for the last decade, even, even more. So for us, it's personal and um, it's really a matter of us, our day-to-day -day survival. And the fact that one event, one climatic event can wipe out, you know, the, the GDP and the, the resources that a country would have put towards development. And it takes years for any of the islands to really recover. Um, so that's a, a personal mission of ours. Thank you, Stacey. I think when we see those events on our screens, it's very easy to understand why climate change is so personal. And I guess the, the parallel situation in Australia is our, our recent unprecedented bushfires where uh, climate change and extreme events became very, very personal for many of us here also. And then finally, Rufus, um, did you have a light bulb moment? How did you, how did you get to be in the driver's seat on this? So I, uh, I grew up in a household where I had a father who was involved in uh, major battles on protecting wilderness areas, including here in, here in Tasmania, and it put, the, put environment issues squarely on my agenda as a, as a university student back in the late 80s, and actually did work on mitigating, uh, mitigating pollution through carbon taxes uh, and then through broader kinds of taxes. I did to look at other kinds of pollutions. I accepted back then in the days of the you know, first Kyoto Protocol, that this was an essential thing to happen um, and assumed that that would, would uh, proceed. And so was interested in the whole range of other instruments to, to tackle uh, public policy instruments to tackle uh, pollution of all kinds. 
And then really it was in the 2000s when having had that firmly on my radar, we weren't getting anywhere. Um, and uh, just having watched nothing happen for a decade as I was engaged in other things, uh, that when I started to have the opportunity of institutional leadership, um, I recognised was nothing was happening. It was going to take starting to get action at an institution level and supporting other people and sharing knowledge that was going to make it make it happen. Um, and uh, uh, but it goes back for me a very uh, a very long way. Um, uh, and uh, that painful moment of not seeing things happen. Thanks, Rufus. It's amazing um, what frustration can drive. <laughs> um, I think. It, a lot of us are motivated by frustration. All right, if I go to some of the questions in the Q&A now, the, the first one that's been there right from the beginning is a, is a specific question for Jim Longhurst, um, which is our attendees very interested in the climate literacy materials for staff and what they look like at Bristol. Um, could you say a little bit more about that, Jim? Okay, um, happy to do that. Um, so what we're developing is carbon literacy materials to empower our staff, to give them confidence, to talk about how the climate and particularly solutions um, can be introduced in the context of the disciplines that they teach. And that will differ according to the vast array of, of, of different disciplines that we have. Now, we're in a slightly fortunate position compared to many in that we've been working very hard to make sure that sustainability um, is present in all of our taught programs of study. And we, we've had that externally verified through our ISO 14001 audit processes. Um, so we know we've got sustainability present. We know we've been able to develop uh, approaches that will make staff feel confident and enabled to talk about sustainability right across the disciplines. And what we're now doing is, is building materials that will be appropriate to have conversations with staff so that they can then incorporate that material into parts of the programs of study that they're responsible for. So we'll talk about emissions, we'll talk about impacts, but actually what we're really interested in is what, what can the discipline that you as an academic staff member are engaged in, what, what are the solutions that your discipline have to mitigate or to adapt to the consequences of climate change. And we've got a team working on this. We're very fortunate. We've got a cross university um, academic team called the Knowledge Exchange for Sustainability Education. They're working with our sustainability team with the carbon action manager, the energy manager, and the travel and transport manager to develop um, these um, initiatives. Uh, we trialed that in the, in, um, the launch of the last academic year when we were all learning how to do things online. And now we've been running it again in, with small groups to build, um, to build our confidence and to build colleagues' confidence about how they can take that forward. And using, uh, in the United Kingdom, we've recently had new guidance on education for sustainable development, which gives us another route in to try and feed ideas of, of carbon and climate literacy into different disciplines. So there's a, a rich array of opportunity. We haven't cracked it yet, um, but we're working at it. And we will, as we, as we build these things, we'll, we'll make those publicly available. We'll talk about it at conferences. Happy to have uh, people emailing me um, so that we can keep a dialogue open. And anything good that others in other institutions that are on this call have done, don't hesitate to share it with me. Thanks very much, Jim. I'm going to go next to the question from Shari McCammon, who's basically asking the, the, the question that often gets asked at, at these sorts of events, which is the role of um, small actions versus collective and political action. So she asks, um, as a scientist, she's dismayed at the slow pace of political action. As universities get our own houses in order, how can we pressure governments to stop acting for their fossil fuel mates and donors and act on climate for future generations? And surely that matters more than our own small actions. Would, would any of the panel like to sort of tackle that thorny question of, of collective and political advocacy versus small individual actions and, and the role of universities in charting a course through that conundrum. Uh, Rufus, you've got your hand up, thank you. 
Yeah, I think this is a, is a critical question. I think it's a multi-dimensional kind of approach. Uh, on the one hand, I think we have to engage very strongly with public policy processes uh, to actually be driving those outcomes and helping government to actually understand and chart how the course is to make it safer in policy terms for them to be able to do it. There are lots of kind of questions and barriers that actually they need pathways on. I saw Matt, and great to have you in the kind of session, Matt, um, putting a linked question about how do we get pathways. Universities are ideally placed to help governments and countries understand pathways. So I think there's very active kind of work that we need to be confident to engage in. Second piece is we have to change the community opinion that changes government. Um, I think there's still a lot more we can do to be uh, ensuring that we are much more broadly engaging the wider community in more innovative ways. Uh, so the community builds both understanding and confidence in the pathway to the future. And the third thing is places which are supportive of academic freedom. Um, we have to ensure that our people have their, uh, are, are supported by our universities to have their voices, um, you know, right down to things like we were prepared to do, which is make it clear people are welcome to go on climate strikes and uh, uh, exercise their own voices uh, as they need. So that we're working on, uh, we're working on all fronts. And just so that people don't despair on a day like today, um, uh, the Tasmanian government's announcing today it will legislate for net zero by 2030. Um, so not far off. Um, and uh, I think uh, the shift of opinion, their confidence in a pathway uh, to doing uh, that, um, a great many of my colleagues have contributed to creating an atmosphere where governments can have confidence to do bold things, uh, uh, bold things like that. So I, I think it is it is doable if we're comprehensive in our approach. Thanks very much, Rufus, and thanks for addressing Matt England's um, question also. All right, um, a question now from an anonymous attendee about um, internally what we do in universities to overcome blockages. So the question is, says, I agree on the important role universities should, could, must play. And as a senior level administrator without training in climate and sustainability, I've, what I found most difficult is to move the dial within my university. How to overcome internal divisions and barriers or roadblocks to help position the university to take bold and immediate action. Uh, the university structure is slow to respond. How did UNSW, the University of Tasmania and the University of Bristol um, overcome internal challenges? So Rufus, I've got you on the screen now. So why don't you um, have a go uh, at it and then I'll go to, to Ian and then perhaps Jim. Well, um, I think the key here is we had a group of activist staff who were very clear that the university had to change. Um, and that probably involved having pressure when they changed leadership um, of the university that actually um, there was a recognition from our university council level, we needed to be making some choices about the kind of people who could embody that and set, it, set up the barriers eliminate those barriers from the top. I'm not sure. I think there are a lot of rigid structures that are very hard to change. And I sympathise with colleagues in environments where that's still challenging. Thanks, Rufus. Ian, your, um, your views thanks. on overcoming blockage? Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, this is a really good question. It, it, it relates at various levels to the question before about how do you shift government and how do you get action? And I, I think that this whole story of how climate action, climate activity and agitation turns into action will be a wonderful exemplar of grassroots action. Because I don't think people should despair or underestimate the, in, the impact that individual action or groups of people taking action has at institutional level, national level and global level. I think what we're seeing here is a groundswell of people coming together, pushing really hard because the the, the obstacles that really need to be overcome are what I call the three I's. Ignorance about the facts, inconvenience in making change, and interests, vested interests that stand against change. And I, I've seen it in my university, the power of the voice of individual students and staff speaking out gave me the muscle to shift things amongst those in the university who were 
slow to want to make change. And I see that now happening at national and global level. So I'm, I'm optimistic that that groundswell of individual people speaking out, you may not get what you want tomorrow, but keep doing it because you will over a period of time. And, and I believe just in time, um, get, it, it will be heard. And you know, Matt England has asked a question there. Matt England is a great um, scientist and a great advocate for the International Universities Climate Alliance. I'm really grateful to him for his work at UNSW in so many ways. He's asked the question, is, is Australia a chain slowing us down? You bet it is. But even in Australia now, we are seeing that the grassroots pressure that will win or lose elections of voters is beginning to change the behaviour of our government, which has been very, very slow. So keep, keep pushing, keep working hard. And I, I think things are changing. Thanks, Ian. And we are seeing that playing out this very week, are we not, in yeah. Australia? Um, I'm going to go to, to Jim and then Stacey and then Steve. Um, Jim, your internal institutional barriers and blockages, what's, what, what can you tell yeah, our, um, our audience as to how to overcome them best? How to overcome them. Uh, conversation. Leaders need to talk. They need to talk about the issues, just as we were hearing from Rufus and Ian. It's about having the conversation and being prepared to engage with those who don't want that conversation. And if all of the conversation with staff isn't getting the movement that you're looking for, remember your greatest allies are the students. Our students are very concerned about the climate emergency. It is causing eco-anxiety in young people. They are looking to us to make sure that we are engaged and they will be very powerful advocates that will break the barriers if we ourselves don't do it. So have the conversations, be open about some of the challenges. We don't know all the, the answers. We may not even know all the questions we need to be asking, but by engaging in that conversation, we will raise the overall capability for change and that capacity will enable us to move the agenda forward. But it's time consuming. It involves leaders actively engaging in those debates and being prepared to change your view. And actually some people might uh, have a view that you then need to reinterpret and incorporate in your own dialogue with others. Conversation. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Let, let me go to Stacey. Um, Stacey, of course, um, institutional barriers must be particularly challenging when you have a university that is distributed as yours is across 17 countries, I can't even imagine the difficulties that that, that raises. Um, tell us your experiences and, and what you've done to overcome these issues. Sure, you're absolutely right, Leslie, are trying to move and shape new policy directions when you work in this distributed fashion. And of course, across island territories can be can be quite challenging, but not insurmountable. And what I've seen is that when it comes to the climate action agenda, our students are some of our, you know, biggest advocates. And I think um, that has also helped to push and to give increased impetus and momentum to the changes that need to happen and that are happening. So for example, our uh, student leaders uh, that represent the guilds of students across our five campuses, they piloted a policy on environmental sustainability and um, protection of the environment and made sure that that got to the top of the agenda at our university committee and, and received approval. So it was their voices coming through on behalf of the student body in those com committees with our vice chancellor and representatives of our ministries of education across the region and our university administration and so on. That is what helped to galvanize support. And now um, our campuses are being asked to continue that drive and to implement the policy. Um, but beyond that, I think um, more and more, as our previous speaker said, that you know the fact that they represent the, the grassroots organization, the you know the, the next generation of leaders, and also the voting uh, group constituents across different countries that they have, they are forced to reckon with, and we we see uh, more and more our students being. Uh, strong advocates. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was the first Caribbean youth parliament on climate justice. And we saw where 
the majority of the representatives who took part were actually UWI students, UWI recent graduates. And this is something we're very proud of because they are, they are the ones who are championing this and we have to meet, and they're holding us to account as well. So that symbiotic relationship needs to, um, will be at the core of change and transformation. So that's something that's very healthy for us. Thanks, Stacey. What a fantastic example of students not allowing geography to stand in their way. That's really wonderful. And it's a lesson for, for the globe. Um, Steve, finally, on this particular question, you must have seen a great variety of approaches across the universities that are, are part of Second Nature. Is there any commonality to the way in which they've attempted to overcome internal or other institutional blockages? Yeah, I, I will say that uh, I, that many presidents that have signed the climate leadership commitments would also agree that they were prompted by their student populations to, to do so. Uh, but the other ways to have longevity, to integrate it into the institutional priorities, we've seen the adoption at the board of trustee level and the sign off. And then when there is an issue in the United States where the executive turnover is, it happens uh, a lot and fast. So it, it, having it at the board level is important where then it's also included in the hiring process for the new executive. So they're aware right up front that it's an institutional priority and they're taking on an institutional commitment made um, you know, from their predecessor. Uh, and another way that we try to support that is we have the new uh, executive uh, re reaffirm or re-sign so that they can put their name on it as well. And that seems to be helpful. And it's a cross campus, um, you know, public event that really helps to re-energize and reaffirm the commitment on the behalf of the institution. Thanks very much, Steve. I'm, I'm getting signals from um, our administrator to, to, to wind up. So I'm only going to just pose one more quick question to everybody. So my apologies to the other questions in the Q&A. We will um, uh, see if people can respond to you um, in writing. But I want to bring us back to something that's very, very topical, which is the Glasgow COP in three weeks. Um, some in Australia have already commented that the COP has already been successful because we are seeing here in Australia a government that's procrastinated on climate for eight years. Um, suddenly waking up to the fact that climate change is an electoral and economic issue and are scrambling this week, just this week, to produce a net zero target and a climate policy for 2030. And we'll be expecting some announcements on Monday. So from that perspective, Glasgow's already been a success. But I'd just like to ask all our panelists finally, and it'll have to be brief, um, what are you hoping to see come out of the COP? What will your criteria for success be? And how you think um, what happens at COP will actually affect your institutions and your approaches to this critical challenge. So Steve, maybe I'll start with you because you're on the screen and then I'll go to our other four panelists and then we'll have to wrap up. I may have missed the, the exact question, uh, just involvement in, in COP. And, yes. and Glasgow. What, what, uh, so, would you, what would you like to come out of it? You know, by the middle of November and and beyond, how would you like to see the world be changing from your perspective? Oh, well, I, I think we're very focused uh, on the sector. So I would like to see out of uh, out of COP just an increased uh, collective effort for universities globally. Uh, and and so we we have a small delegation going. Uh, and we are seeking, actually, do you mind, we are seeking uh, representatives from universities that are attending to try to coordinate. So would you mind if I drop the survey into the chat, if any, Not at all. Not at all. If anyone yeah. would um, want to fill that out. So hopefully we can meet up when we're there. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, Stacey, well, if you're still here with us, I can't see you, but... Um, what for the Caribbean in particular and your consortium for SDG 13, um, what would a successful COP look like for you? Um, thanks, Leslie. For us in the Caribbean, 
it's really important that we see um, uh, some of our larger countries deliver on their promises to uh, and commitments made to the small island developing states and also to increase climate financing and the access to climate financing so that major projects can be implemented and, the, and that we can have the collective solutions that we have come up with move forward. So that's um, in terms of at the country level and working, you know, some of the different um, island states working together and having the support from, from countries across um, the globe. The, in, with regard to the university and the, the Global University Consortium, for us, how we can receive dedicated support um, for um, collaborations with other consortia and also to ensure that we strengthen the science policy interface that is at the core of translating university research into policy and practice. So those are two specific um, wins for us and outcomes that we'd like to see from COP26. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, Jim, a couple of thoughts? Um, two things, I think. Firstly, that the national determined contributions give us the confidence that pathways exist to, one, to keep within 1.5. Um, and that the finance to support low and middle income countries turns from rhetoric into reality. There's been really promising developments in the last week. Um, and let's just see that move to a position where the finance that's needed for adaptation as well as mitigation is actually in place and the mechanisms to translate that are, are in place. In terms of institutions um, of higher education, it's about the role that we can play as those pathways and as that finance begins to move its way around the world to, to move us ever more towards the, the position where the worst excesses that we were fearing do not come to, to uh, reality. Thanks, Jim. Ian, a couple of last words from you. Thanks, Leslie. Well, you know, it's no exaggeration to say that we really are running out of time. This is a desperate situation. And what I'm expecting out of COP26 is a major series of commitments that represent a massive step change in awareness and action by nations across the world, which is sustained. And I want the International Universities Climate Alliance to make sure that coming out of COP26, whatever is agreed is sustained and leads to more action and progress. Thanks Ian. And, and finally, Rufus as the, the host, um, yep. Some last words from, from you. To settle the targets question once and for all, and then focus our global effort on what the deep technological and social changes are needed and ensure that we get those frames so universities can put their massive global effort um, against the technical and social challenges that have to be solved with precision and urgency uh, is what we need. Thanks, Rufus. And I'd like to thank the University of Tasmania for, for hosting this event, for our technician Belinda behind the scenes to make making everything go smoothly. And of course, most of all to our five fantastic panelists today um, that have given us so many inspirational ideas. I'm personally inspired to go back to my own university and tell them to pull their socks up and get with some better programs. Um, what you're seeing on the screen now is um, the next couple of events in the Island of Ideas series. Um, so the University of Tasmania, I'm sure, would be very, very happy to have you on and participating in those events. So um, wherever you are in the globe, I hope you have a great day or a great evening. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. It's been a great conversation. Uh, it's been very inspiring personally. Let's all look forward to the COP in a couple of weeks being a game changer for the planet. That's what we need. Uh, and it's something that I hope we can all be part of. So thank you. Good day for me. Good evening for others. Thank you. <laughs>